for 15 years, putting on meetings, putting out publications, acting as an information clearinghouse for Chinese government, NGO business researchers, you know, networking around the world focused on energy and environmental issues. Now, under the environmental umbrella, food safety. Back in mid-2000s, um, I started when there was the big contaminated milk scandal, melamine issues, dog food, and, you know, impacting the U.S., the fish problems with too much uh, antibiotics. Um, I, I had a funder come to me, a, a company came and said, hey, why don't you guys look into food safety in China? I said, sure. Because foods, how food is produced in China is very much has a lot of environmental impacts. In fact, here's the quiz. I know it's really cruel. You came to a meeting to relax and eat cookies and drink coffee. But what's the, what sector is the number one polluter of water in China? Agriculture, right. And that it's not just the runoff from the fields, but also meat production, pork production, pigs produce, or livestock in general, produces three times the waste in China as industry does. And so, I mean, that said, we also have municipal wastewater problems and industrial wastewater, but agriculture can also be a polluter. Agriculture can be, you know, there's issues of waste in terms of water, in terms of other resources, waste in the supply chain. My WWF people, where you guys wave your hands, they're looking. We had them a couple months ago talking about waste in the chicken supply chain. And, you know, and <coughs> the cows have officially protested and said, the pigs and the chickens have gotten attention at the China Environment Forum. It's time for the cows. Um, so, so today, so we did, but back in 2006, 7, 8, 9, we did a lot of meetings and we had a publication called Sowing the Seeds that looked at, it's only online, we've given them all away, looking at U.S., China, food, what's happening, mainly China, but also in the U.S., and how food safety is actually an area where we, we have a level playing field. Because guess what? We all need to eat. <laughs> the safety and but our food supply chains are even more so than back in 2009 when I finished the big push and in, in research on food safety our food sectors are so intimately linked so we started Susan um, Chan Shiflet who's my associate as of almost three years she when she came to work for me she had a big interest in food safety issues because she used to work in the Department of State's Office of Global Food Security and so she kind of was not, I didn't go there fighting, kicking and screaming. I wanted to do more on food safety, but needed someone to help me move that way. So last year, we started a series of meetings. Besides WWF, we have others coming and talking about what's going on in the food sector. And so today, we're doing it again on a hot summer day in DC. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we're going to be kind of diving, you know, the food safety, food production is a big issue to wrap your arms around. But so we're going to look at it from you know, taking kind of a few different snapshots. Um, we've got uh, Shui Hua Zhang, who I've known forever, seriously, when she was a PhD student at RFF and all that good stuff, right? You were, but I always knew her more as working, she was spoken for me before on energy issues, coal fire power plants. I thought she was, you know, coal was her middle name. Well, it ends up that um, she's, <laughs> she's, at, she's, she's now at Sichuan University at a Institute of New Energy and Low Carbon Technology, so still doing the coal and carbon stuff. But on the side, I'm sure, you know, family, coal issues, still have time to work with um, one, of the, one of the dynamic um, NGOs in, I, I would say, in Western China, yeah. Kura, yeah. Chengdu Urban Rivers Association. And she's been doing some work with them, and she happened to be in town. So this is, if you guys are unhappy at the meeting, we will blame her at the end. Because we had this meeting because she was coming to town, grabbed Sabrina and Susan to join in the conversation. But that she's been doing this work with, with Kura on how to make agricultural production, in this case, just in, a, in an area outside Chengdu, more sustainable in that it, it's protecting the water. Because we already learned here a minute ago that ag is the largest polluter of water. Keeping the water safe keeps the soil safe, keeps the food safe. So she's going to be telling us some stories about what Kura is doing. The group's been around for 10 years. So it's a pretty significant NGO. Um, then we've got Sabrina Snell. Shu is currently a research fellow at the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. And prior to that, she's been, and she could tell you about some of the research she's doing there, but she's, she's, she's the one that's bringing the cows to us today. <laughs> I'm sure that's not how you, type one type of cow, dairy. Um, she did her PhD at the Institute of Development Studies in the U.K., and she looked at the dynamics and regulation of China's dairy industry. So, yeah, so more than one cow. But so she's going to talk to us about, so we, we're going to talk about this, this snapshot, a microcosm of, of possibly sustainable ag, protects water, food, soil. 
Then we go to the dairy industry, which is really much, much maligned, perhaps deservedly so in China. But looking at, sh you're going to tell us some stories about what's been going on there, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities. And because we are in beloved Washington, D.C., talking about food safety in China kind of raises the question, mm, so what? Why does it matter to us? And so Susan is going to talk a little bit about what this means, you know, not only the, the problems, but the potential solutions, that what it means for U.S.-China trade and cooperation. And your job is to stay awake. It's late afternoon. It's hot. Get your coffee. But, and to ask them hard questions when they're done. Uh, those of you who know me know that I'm rarely cruel to my speakers. Don't give them much time to talk. So they must be swift on their feet and limber in their lips and tell us lots of good stories. And so we're going to start off. Are you guys all set? Coffee, cookies? All right. So let's, let's give a warm welcome to my speakers today. And Shui Hua, and, and just so you know that, the, that we are webcasting, so you can't like be a ping pong ball. You can, you can stand up. I'm so mean. Short time, can't move. No, I don't mind you standing up, but just don't. What? You just need the microphone, too. Because unless you can yell really loud, they're not going to hear you online. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer, just, for the invitation. I know it's a little last minute. Um, so my work actually was on the compliance enforcement for many years. So this is a field I'm, I'm walking into. I'm leading efforts, putting into a project on a similar subject. So, um, and, and you could you could see the screen here. So don't, oh, don't okay. keep looking at these lovely people in front of you. All right, that works. Okay. Anyway, so the um, so the today's presentation really focuses on this model village. And we did actually almost 10 years ago. I was involved, but not heavily, and I'm taking to the next step. So um, first, I'm giving a little background on how this project was started, and then talking about the local initiative, why they started to focus on the agricultural pollution. And then also this model village has a key components of how they put the things together, how that worked. And then also the main outcome, going overview that. Then just very brief about the next steps we're talking about. Um, so here, just give you a little view where is the Chengdu I'm talking about. So there's China. Chengdu is like a southwest. They're probably the most prominent city in China, and uh, southwest of China. Um, the where um, go back here a little bit. So that's Chengdu, and where the project will be will be like a little bit over, but not so much. So in the by the end of 1980s, early 90s. So water, two rivers run through this Chengdu actually become so polluted. And there was lots of complaints. So the government started um, probably most wild known project that we call the Chengdu Full Land River, two rivers, comprehensive improvement project. Started in 1992, was headed by the vice mayor of the city. Um, this project intention was designed to uh, involve like a flood control, environmental protection, both focus on water quality, and the resettlements of forestation, road networks, and cultural heritage. You can see it's very comprehensive. It involved uh, resettlement over, I think it was like 30,000 families along the two river banks, and it lasted almost 10 years. So we would expect by end of this project, the river should be clean. Because they closed down all the uh, factories along the river banks, they, they repipe the pipelines and then put it somewhere else. So we would not think any industry water which was actually would go into this river and the river should be clean. But what happens by end of the two thousand by end of the project, the water is still dirty. Okay. The quality is still low and it is still short of water. So not much water actually going through the rivers. Some of the parts of the rivers are actually dried. Um, so here is the water. So the water actually if you remember I have I have another next map come up. So the water comes from the northwest of Chengdu is class two water, which that means it's drinkable. Okay, this is based on the surface water quality standard in China. Then well, by the time they got through Chengdu and went out, it becomes the less, even worse than class five, which means industrial waste. So then we are talking about why it's so bad. Um, so what happens is meanwhile, you know, because of the city is growing so fast, so we there you can s I'm just showing you a little bit of the satellite image of the construction land. That was in 1968, okay? Very little. Then by 1988, barely doubled. Not too bad. But the next 10 years, 20 years really took off. So that's where the problem. So we start looking at it saying, well, it's not necessarily urban problem anymore. 
is a peril urban, maybe even rural areas. So we start looking up, upstream, so where the water come in, what happens along the, those rivers. We call the Ming River, actually one of the major ones. Uh, so the Kura, which is the Chengdu Urban Rivers Association, Kura, whatever, so we call Kura, was founded in 2003, actually by a bunch of the people, like uh, government officials, actually worked on this project and the research, like myself, and, and, and some of the university uh, students. So it's just a bunch of the people who care about the river, who worked on that big project before they got together and they set up this NGO. So it's an NGO, they work on the water particularly and they focus on the peril urban and the rural areas. They, one of the goals they really want to do is to find a solution that based on the local, not the, uh, anything we borrow from outside. So they really want to focus on the local agricultural practice and how we recover that, uh, maintain that. So before they started the project, they did the uh, two years, actually me a little bit involved, but I used they because that was there, uh, they were, I was in the US, so I didn't do that much, most of the work. So the Cura actually did a pre-research, so that was done mostly by volunteer, by uh, graduate students. Um, for two years, they surveyed all the, uh, many of the villages along the river, and the industries or the governments, and they, at the end of 2004, I believe, at that point, the two year period, they recognized, this is 11 years ago, okay, they recognized the non-point source agricultural pollution. Actually, it was the main source of the pollution for Chengdu. For this city, this city is 40 million people, by the way. Oh, it's a small of city. This today. Yeah. Small city. Yeah, well, not small. 14 million, come on. So then, at that point, uh, during that process, they decided uh, to focus on the pollution control at the source, which means the beginning of the rivers and within the village itself. And uh, they, in that process, also they did you know, a two years study they started building correlation, you know, the relationship with the farmers and the research institute and local governments, particularly this um, uh, one of the towns there. So those are the waste. Okay, the human waste, the uh, animal waste, all treated as waste, not resource anymore. Because it's just a dump in the river or just, and a particular sanitation problem is huge. That's where the waste, the human waste went, right? Um, so the overuse of a chemical fertilizer and pesticide, that's just over China, over the world, it's not only their problem, but we start recognize the skill and the intensity of that. Um, that's how the river looks like, back to 2002 or three, okay, in that, uh, along those rivers, among those villages. And that's where they find it. So in that process, they identified, find a, a township who was very interesting, township had very interesting their idea willing to give a piece of the village or a couple of the village for trying. So that's where we identify, oh, sorry. So that where is, so that's the Chengdu, see that? So that's the uh, model village side, that's where the water come from, okay? That's the main river, see that? That's our drinking so when the water source, that's where that from. Um, the first thing I did, I think it was really smart, once they decided the site, they actually went after the farmers. So they decided in order for this thing to work, the number one thing you have to work with the farmers. Listen to what they wanted. Basically you want to change it from what we want you to do and into what you want to do with your village, with your water quality, with your land, with the food you produce, what are you going to eat, what are you going to produce. So I think that was really good. So they did a lot of consultation with the farmers and identified the priorities. One is the transportation, another one is the water concern. And if anybody can read the Chinese, can say the technical capacity is not enough and also about the uh, sanitation was an issue too. Um, so here is the, I just try to go through the quickly, but if people have a question, we can talk later. So there are the key components of this model village. One, I think the most interesting one is a closed cycle eco households. I will get into more details later. One is uh, biogas digesters and uh, uh, urine diverting, composting, Toilets. That's important, actually. I never noticed that, how important <laughs> is that? <laughs> because I grew up in the cities. And also constructed wetlands for that wastewater, so human producer, basically. And some of the from the animal, high concentration wastewater. Um, then we got to the e ecological farming. So that could include in the um, crops and also the fishing, ducks, those kind of stuff. Then we talk about the um, community supported agriculture. I wouldn't get too much into this, but we put a lot of efforts building that, is to building the farmers and urban residents consumer coalitions. 
And for me, like I'm one of the consumers there. I get the food twice a week from them. And I'm pretty happy moving back and you know, have that back up. And then is education. They put a lot of efforts educating the uh, mostly um, village kids, children, and uh, uh, young people, but also the urban area. Like uh, people are going there almost every week, okay, to work with the farmers and you get hands on experience over the winter, weekend and, and see how the food produced. And also some cultural development. I'm not getting too much of this because uh, there's time limit. <laughs> Sorry. That's <laughs> so okay. that's the circle, give you just a little idea, okay, I just have to look at this. So basically two parts, livestock and human waste, okay. Water come here, the clean water come from here and goes to this too, and they are the one produce waste. And the biogas digesters, you know, they put, they take the waste from here, and then they produce clean energy actually, biogas for the humans to use, and but also they could feed back, you know, as organic uh, fertilizer for the farming part. And then also have the, you know, waste, they got wetlands, and that mostly the trade is the human waste, you know, high concentrations. And uh, what's missing, which is that the next graph is the, do you see that market? So that's where they produce profit. That's how we keep the farmers, the entire model sustainable. Okay, you will see that it's quite significant in that part. And I'm not gonna get into details, but what I'm gonna say is a fairly close system and the treating the human and the life humans and the livestock waste and the for farming and also the kind of for fungus cultivation and produce goods and there's very little recyclable waste. There's still some solid waste being discharged, but very small. Um, so well, let's go through the first one. It's uh, called the biogas digesters. So they're treating the animal waste, okay? And they produce organic fertilizer. I think if people have any idea about how this work, I probably know those details. I think that what's most important here, you know, produce, like this is the guy, Wang Chen, probably the most successful farmer there, okay? He makes uh, 150,000 renminbi a year, which is quite good. 150,000, so it's pretty good. And he actually even got married, uh, uh, found his wife through this work, and uh, is a, a city girl. He's a farmer, he married to a city girl just because of this work, <laughs> it's a real story. So, and what I think is important about it, this is the first step we took there, is to build the trust. So when a bunch of the cities, you know, experts, what are government officials or professors, students went there talking about, yeah, we want to protect the waters, you know, river gets bad. They said, well, we don't drink water from there. We <laughs> don't care. Who cares? We just produce something. You know, they both get underground water, okay? They're not drinking from the water, so we drink. So this is where we got their support, actually. So they, because that's what they care the most, because they want to improve their environment. So they wanted to have sort of um, little clean, energy going on there, okay. So that's their training for um, biogas, you know. We mostly produ produce, uh, pro provide like that technical support, but they build it themselves, okay. We didn't build those um, digesters for them. So that's important, keep in mind. All the initiative come from them. We're produ we provide the technical support and also funding. We did provide funding for that. And uh, also we look for the experts could help them, but uh, we didn't build for them. So the actual came from farmers. What I'm going to say is uh, um, this uh, first of the digestion, also not as a toilet, also help us by the heart of the farmers who will to work with us. Okay, I just want to put that in so. Um, another one is this toilet. Oh, please go ahead. Okay, so the, um, the toilet basically, um, I'm not getting too much into details, but the original idea comes from Sweden. So we actually made a trip, not me, but they made a trip to uh, Stockton, actually talk to them and then find out the technology was actually imported in China. And so they adopted the technology modified. We actually produce, even had an expert on our team now, full time working on this, how to make that work, improving it. Um, but it's really cool actually in that. So there's two holes. The front actually is for earrings and the back is for faces. And it's a little work, I, I can get that later on but in terms of maintenance. But the both can be separate and can be reused. That's the key part. Conserve the water and produce organic fertilizer. And so that's how that looks like. Before, it was a pretty, you know, disgusting and a very, uh, it's a very little, you know, it's not actually affecting their health too. And now you got a clean one. So the third component, I think, is a wet, constructed wetland. And this one, is they have two actually built for the households. And this wetland, and most, all, most, of the, most of the individual household actually build their wetland. Okay, it's a very small scale and uh, looking very pretty, it's like, and local landscape in a way. Um, so they trade the household wastewater, they also recycle the waters back for uh, irrigation. 
Um, so there are two styles, pond bed wastewater treatment system. If anybody been to Zhaigo, which yeah. is in Sichuan, that's where they got the idea. Okay, both of them, terrace style. It's very pretty and it takes um, steps like one up there and different plants for different uh, purpose. Uh, I'm not expert on that, so I won't get into that. But I know work. And uh, you can see how water dirt, how dirty is. And uh, by the time you walk like 10 meters away, then how clean the water is. Amazing. Um, so then the second big component actually the ecological farming. That was not our original idea when we started the whole project, right? But uh, we quickly recognized that if you want to reduce the use of a fertilizer and uh, um, pesticide, what's the alternative? Basically, you have to start recycle the human and the, um, plant waste and animal waste. They try to recycle them back to the farming. That's where they get fertilizers, right? They improve their productivity. So that's how they did. Um, this is a big part. They actually, all the farmers, I think the nine households actually still existing now, making the profits from the organic farming. They actually, every one of them took two or three years in order to start to have a production because you have to net the land sit there and, uh, and you know kind of sort of re-fertilizer and get rid of the chemicals. We all know that, those things. Um, so this is the guy I mentioned it before. So this is a Chinese uh, traditional practice we call ducks in rice paddle fields. Dao Ya He Tian. So which means when you do the, you know, you, you grind the grains, you also have uh, animals, particularly the ducks running around eating all those, you know, bad things and giving the fertilizer, <laughs> you know, they're, 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 you know, the same thing, they get back to the land. And, uh, so that's, uh, this guy actually, uh, I actually bought, you know, uh, getting the ducks from him like once a month, really cool, <laughs> tasty. And in that next <laughs> one, I think it's really good. I mean, organic, really yeah, yeah. tasty, totally. So mm. the next one, I think we put a lot of efforts, which is still ongoing efforts. We, there are lots of challenges associated with that, is to how to get the food to the uh, cities. And meanwhile, we keep that diversity. The problem is the diversity, because they only grow seasonal food. And uh, for the small scale farmers, and some of the food, like particularly tomatoes, it's really hard to actually grow them and maintain the um, yield. And I can, you know, my personally, I in Chengdu, I did that too, didn't go anywhere. First year, I didn't have any fruit, like uh, tomatoes. And because of pollution and acid rain, all these things contributed to that. And another problem is the bees. I recognize I have all those flowers, so I don't, I don't get any like, tomatoes. Because I don't have bees. So this year was a lot better. I got probably dozens of tomatoes on my roof garden. So that's really hard is that because many people complained uh, the vegetables are too simple, and you only get uh, that many of uh, varieties, so they're looking for um, you know, different uh, things. So we actually have to work with the people, like in the cities, make them understand this is not only you getting good food, it's also supporting the farmers. If there are more farmers doing this kind of business, you likely get a lot bigger variety of the food. I think many of people actually got it, so that's, um, we spend a lot of time on that. Let me, because I think I did have someone from Kura talk to me at one point back to the, con the c didn't, I think, wasn't there an effort to take busloads of people from Chengdu out to the farms? Yeah. I took that picture out. I have that picture. And, and getting getting yeah. to know the farmers. <laughs> yeah. Because the concept of CSAs, because we all know it, right? Yeah. Nod your heads, yes. And, but it was really revolutionary in China. Right. And the idea, I think, is just building this trust, actually, between the farmers and the consumers. That's why, like, next slide shows they fix the price together. It's the same idea. So, like, Jennifer mentioned that they did, actually, a number of times took the big bus and have a bunch of people went there to see, actually make them work on the field. And that makes a huge difference when they see how the food is being grown and, and they kind of develop this connection to that. I think that makes a huge difference, but it's still ongoing process because some people actually withdraw and some people jump in. So we're still working on that, how we can get the food without much cost and uh, to the people in the city. Meanwhile, the people were willing to compromise sort of variety of the food to support the farmers so we could have a bigger pool of the vegetables in the future. We, I think that's uh, one of the purpose actually for this um, project that w I'm trying to put together. Um, so this is the education. I mean, they just you know we did a lot, that both ways. Not only I, here I said the villagers, but also the citizens, and like, uh, urban area, and uh, urban residents, because that's also the education for them. People are so removed from um, farming now; they actually don't know, have no idea. So that's what we're doing. The children did some work there, um, so there's more work. This is interesting, actually. I put there. Uh, I didn't know that Jennifer took that out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so is. 
we actually didn't talk about this, didn't think about the educational center was important until we recognize this is a bigger problem. I'm going to spend one minute on this. Is urbanization in China of the countryside is a huge impact. It was a widespread. And particularly Chengdu is a model. Okay, back to the 19, no, 2000. They spent this, they call centralized, um, no, what's a centralized approach. Basically, they try to get all the farmers from the land and go to the one place, is building a concentrated, you know, a sort of town, whatever. They call the new town. And for those farmers. So, which means the farmers are removing from their lands. And they have to walk kilometers, sometimes like 20 or 30 kilometers, do that. So, what happens? They quit. So they become the industrialization of the agriculture. That's happening in China and also happening in Chengdu. So what we got now is at the Pearl urban area, particularly around the Chengdu, more and more farmers don't want to work now. So they think it's very tiring and lots of energy. I don't necessarily make that much money on this uh, from the farming. And so they start thinking about, I mean, particularly they have a taste of the city style life. They were like, oh, well, that's easy. If I have this toilet, just flush it. Why I have to do this to work with separate earrings and faces and I have to collect them and put it in the field? And uh, why don't I just buy the food from the market? So all kinds of things going on. Farmers become, I think, less interesting in kind of sort of traditional farming and uh, putting efforts there. Even while meanwhile, they recognize the problem with water. They're frustrated with that. And they're concerned about the food quality, okay? They had the little patch, they're growing the food only for themselves. They don't use any fertilizer for that patch, but they produce the rest of us with the fertilizer for us. <laughs> okay, so that's a big problem. I think here, we, well then we recognized a couple years ago, we actually do need this called a farming education for farmers. <laughs> kind of recover the traditional um, farming practice and make them understand organic farming actually does it is sustainable, and of course, so you can make profits from it. So that's a huge effort, actually, still ongoing there. So the outcome, I'm not going to the details, but we did some estimates, okay? So first is, you know, unknown trend, this is the Z model village, and the rest of the villages are kind of spell, spelled effects. So we actually, it's starting in two little village again. But we actually had this, you know, entire, I talked about the uh, closed uh, cycle, House, equal households, you know, the kind of system we build for 160 households. It's a lot of huge, and, uh, but it's significant for that village. It pretty much all the villages were covered. And then we had to build a centralized wastewater treatment uh, system for the, that was an experiment, still ongoing, see how that go. And then also started from another village. But in terms of eco eco ecolog ecological farming, that particular practice, we probably had a dozen of the farmers are still doing that. It's a big challenge in terms of doing this long term instead of just one time shot. And because they are doing it individually, we have not quite figured out how we can make them do work collect a community. They're doing it together, not individual farmers doing their own business. They're associated with the Chinese thousands of years uh, um, tradition, culture there. It's really hard to get farmers working together, actually. It's quite a challenge, particularly given the current economic or political conditions in China. I'm not getting into that, but it is a challenge we are facing, particularly for the next phase, is how to get farmers together. We're not talking about big, huge scale industrialized farming, but we're talking about medium size. There is another successful model in Chengdu, which is started by a Taiwanese woman, and, and she has um, close to 500 acres. And uh, it, it, you know that's kind of sort of model we're looking at, I think, in the future. That's more sustainable, actually, for the farmers. So we did a little estimate how, uh, how much water and the solid waste we saved. Um, for that village, it's significant. I, I forgot to put a number, but it's very small. For the water, uh, wastewater and the solid waste, we actually end up discharged. So most of them are actually recycled. Um, the most significant, actually, is at the end. See that? Income levels. Income. That's the key part. I think I would say two key parts. One is how you increase the income, maintain the income for farmers, which means they have the motivation to do this organic farming. It's very tedious, okay? I actually did a little bit, a couple hours there, really. I mean, every day they get up like 5 o'clock to get all the vegetables they have to <coughs> deliver. I mean, I'm not getting into details, but it's really hard. It's a lot harder than use the uh, fertilizer or pesticide, okay? So that's one thing. Another thing I think is harder is how to maintain the pool of the consumers, which you can provide enough um, income for them. And you would think, I mean, I know Susan, everybody's going to talk about the food safety. Chinese is so concerned about the food 
they would be willing to put the money or efforts into that, right? Put up with some of the inconvenience. Surprisingly, it's not. Like myself, my personal experience, I spent half years researching where to get the meat, the dairy, get the vegetables or fruits. I come up on this that I can I trust and yeah, that my ground. So I uh, my background, I think is a pretty good quality. Then I told my friends, only two of them signed up. Okay, it's surprising. Okay. So I know some of them tried and then they quit for a variety of reasons. They're too expensive. Ma and fun. Uh, yeah, that's right. Ma Ma fun. And uh, I mean all kinds of things. So and also, we, with the uh, support from um, National Geographic, we did a little uh, assessment of a still ongoing analysis about uh, this low carbon effect, because we didn't produce anything, right? We didn't produce any extra waste. And it's very interesting. I think all the facts you probably know, organic fertilizer do not use petroleum in the production process. You know, the whole thing is recycled, basically. It's a very natural process. And it's plant-based, so which means it has, it's pretty much carbon neutral. We didn't produce anything more. And Tom, do you want to talk? You're, you're I know your slides are coming. Okay. Through. They were cool. <laughs> and the uh, agrochemicals are not used, which means the soils can act as a carbon sink. Another thing I didn't mention, actually, we also did a quite, I mean, this actually helped the uh, soil remediation, right? So recovering the quality of the soil. So that's the side issue. So that's the next step we're talking about. Uh, that's, um, we're taking this step further for the next one. And the first of all, I want, you know, we're talking about scaling up this model. So there is a township very interesting still along the same area in the drinking water source area of Chengdu where this model village is. And the head of party secretary of the township is very interested. So he is uh, talking about uh, can give us one or two thousand acres to do another project. One probably not aiming for that big, more like a several hundred. And uh, this second is more like my idea because my background is more on the pollution control. Uh, this is just a little background. Is uh, I'm working on a paper looking at the transfer of the pollution from East Coast to Middle and West part of China. All right, it's huge, <laughs> and we don't have any number on that. That's a big. Uh, that's the worst part because the government don't keep track of this uh, relocation, and we are having a hard time to get the solid data. But still, there is a trend very clear moving to and particularly to the rural areas, because like Chengdu, you're out. You can't really put a new industry there. So they are moving to the peril urban area. Some even got into rural areas. So I'm, ta I'm thinking about it for this next phase, we should ca come up more like an integrated approach, co coordinated um, pollution control, considering air, water pollution, and soil remediation, and also putting the industrial and, uh, and agricultural pollution together. And we got a team from national and local universities and research, you know, the think tanks and NGOs. So I think we are good in terms of technical capacity. I think you love um, technology or the stuff there is to figure out how things work, how to make that work. And uh, this um, third one is, uh, is kind of a little bigger idea, is uh, thinking about um, so many years we have talked about uh, the drinking water source protection, but not area. So we are bringing down one level up, talking about not only that reservoir, we're just protecting that little water. We're talking about the area around it because the soil pollution, the water quality, anything can get into that water. So um, we are thinking about, because every city has drinking water source, okay, has our area. So we talk about if we set up the next project as a kind of sort of model, and then sort of developing a model and uh, all the other supporting, providing some supporting technical and uh, financial support to other uh, cities where has NGOs. I think the initiative has come from NGOs because this integrated approach, government, the interest is so fixed and uh, divided. So everybody take a little piece of it, like a water, air, or solid waste. This is hard to for government to think about an integrated approach. So it has come from the NGO or could it be think tank or research institute. So we're kind of trying to say this as a model can be um, referenced to other places. And the ultimate goal is start from the drinking water source um, area protection. But I know there's an implication for many other areas. Um, so having said that, where is that black? But anyway, so I think I just end here. Thank you very much. Looking forward to questions. Okay, good deal. All right. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, there's a lot there. Just take that. So, yes, yeah, so I hold your questions. I mean, because it is, you know, a lot of us, we do a lot of meetings here on, on NGOs. And I know that some of you will have some questions on how it's a unique NGO, again, started by government and researchers. And so, Hold on to those questions. Are you ready there, Suki? We're going to switch. Can I come over here? And just talk out to the, the, the
a kind looking audience out there and we're good. If you want to sit, that's fine too. If you sit more comfortably. Yes, Emma. All right. First of all, thank you, everyone, CF and Jennifer, for having me here. I'm really looking and, forward. And hold the mic up a little bit. There we go. Really looking forward to a great discussion with everyone. Um, I actually think this fits really well in with your presentation. You mentioned that you weren't really getting into the political economy of agricultural industrialization and what's happening in various agricultural industries across China, and that's exactly what I'll be doing here. And some of the challenges that uh, Xue Hao mentioned, I will also sort of highlight in the dairy industry, particularly with farmers working together in integrated models. Um, so as uh, Jennifer mentioned, this is based off of my PhD research at the Institute of Development Studies, looking at the challenges of food safety in the dairy industry. And as many of you know, there was a very, very <laughs> large food safety scandal in 2008 where it was found that melamine was being dumped into the milk supply. Now, melamine is an industrial chemical, and of course, for particularly for infants, it has medical consequences. Um, so, let's start here <laughs> with the presentation, uh, titled yeah. The State Business. Look this way at this oh. one so then they oh. can see. Sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> the State Business and a Half Kilo of Milk, a Study of the Dynamics of Regulation in China's Dairy Industry. Okay, so before uh, President Xi Jinping's Chinese dream, there was actually another dream. Um, <laughs> it was the dairy dream. Um, and in 2006, Premier Wen Jiabao said, I have a dream that every Chinese person, especially the children, will be able to drink one jin, or half a kilo, of milk each day. Now the reason I put this quotation up here is to point out that from the very beginning, the state played a key and central role in both building and organizing the dairy industry in China. Uh, and some of the objectives that it hoped to achieve were in rural development, particularly agricultural industrialization, poverty reduction, and ecological conservation. Um, as many of you probably know, dairy didn't really appear in China until about 15 to 20 years ago. It was never really a prominent part of the Chinese diet. But the Chinese government hoped to boost consumption and particularly nutrition among new urban citizens and therefore promoted the dairy industry. They were also very keen for sort of a win-win situation um, for economic growth and the environment, particularly in Inner Mongolia and in the northeastern, central, and northwestern areas of China. Um, the state envisioned leading, having lead dairy brands linking rural farmers to higher value-added urban markets. Uh, they implemented the outsourcing model, which I'm going to get into in a second. Uh, they also wanted farmers to start moving away from grain, particularly in Inner Mongolia, moving away from grain and starting grassland restoration and reforestation projects. And they thought that dairy could serve as a prime vehicle uh, for these efforts. Um, and obviously the dairy industry was promoted um, as a way of boosting rural incomes and you would shift from nomadic to sedentary lifestyle and from seasonal harvest to a monthly milk check. All right, so the outsourcing model. Um, many of these farmers actually came, well, when I was doing field work in Inner in Mongolia, many of them actually came, I call them the ecological migrants. Um, came from other provinces, from Shanxi, Shanxi, and from Hebei. Uh, and they were organized uh, in this sort of long extended dairy value chain. Um, they were moved into dairy villages um, where they would raise a couple head of cattle uh, and then each day walk their cows to a central milking station. Then that central milking station had one tank which was picked up by a collection truck and then transported to a processor. Now these processors are the dairy brands that you often read in the news, like Meng Ye, Yanyi, Shanyan, Gongyi. Um, and then from there, the processor turned it into various forms of VHT milk, fresh milk, yogurt, cheese, uh, and it ended up with urban consumers. Um, so as uh, Xue Hao mentioned, this is a really long chain and the farmer is actually quite removed from the consumer, which is a problem that he also mentioned and was trying to resolve in Shanxi. Um, and you see the same thing in the, in the dairy industry. 
Um, so with such a long chain, you actually, you don't have ownership over the entire chain, so you have to introduce various governance strategies, such as pricing mechanisms, contracts, quality standards, quantity standards, um, there's all sorts of governance mechanisms. And so that's what these processes hope to do. Um, and where are they? Here they are. Okay, so um, get the map quickly so we can see which areas we're talking about. Um, there's actually a dairy industry, uh, sorry, a dairy industry belt across China, which runs from like Heilongjiang, sweeps down to like Jilin, Liaoning, Beijing, Hebei, then across to Xinjiang. Um, just across the top of China. Obviously, there are also Huangmin is a very popular dairy company in Shanghai, so there are companies in the south. But it tends to the production tends to be in the north. Okay, so this is a picture from one of the farmers that I interviewed. Um, this is in a dairy village that I mentioned under that outsourcing model. Uh, this is one of her cows. She had actually moved from Shanxi province when there was a reservoir that was constructed. And so they were told that they could go um, live in a, in a dairy village in uh, Inner Mongolia and see their incomes go up. Uh, they're cute, friendly cows. I always love having a couple cute cows. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, this is the central milking station that you would see in these dairy villages. Um, farmers would individually milk their cows. You can see here there are a couple farmers, uh, and then take them back to their their home. Okay, so some key outcomes of this model and some positive outcomes of this model is you saw rapid industry growth. Um, dairy took off in China, both in terms of production and consumption. Um, it allowed processors to focus much of their financial resources on the downstream end of the chain. They didn't need to invest in feed and inputs because that's what the farmers were taking care of. Um, and so there was a lot of marketing action and that really, I mean, consumers really started drinking milk in China. Um, you also saw that the majority of the industry is dominated by smallholders. So about 64% of farmers own fewer than 20 cows and 32% of that was actually one to four cows. Um, the other 32% was five to 10, <laughs> uh, or sorry, probably five to 20. Um, also you saw, as I mentioned, change in consumption habits and urban nutrition. Uh, you saw major dairy brands come out of this process and it appeared as though the government was actually achieving many of their national objectives. A uh, couple slides to show you the dairy industry taking off. Again, it's right around so 1999 uh, that production really takes off and then of course the plateau there at the end is the melamine incident and its impact on the dairy industry. Um, consumption, uh, as I pointed out, is very much a campaign among urban consumers. Uh, so you see urban consumption go up while rural consumption barely rises. Um, again, farmers aren't consuming the product that they're producing in this type in this industry. Um, all right, and then there is one very very large negative outcome, and that is what they call in China "jiu yao yao" or dairy "jiu yao yao" or dairy's 9/11. Um, basically, on September 11th. 2008 was when reports of melamine um, in the milk supply first hit the state-run media. And then it became apparent that there was more than one company involved in this incident. There were actually 22 companies and that it was a national problem. Um, as I said a little bit at the beginning of this pre um, presentation, it had medical consequences. There were six deaths that were verified and 296,000 cases of internal chief kidney ailments and urinary problems. Um, and of course, consumers <laughs> were very upset um, and the dairy companies that had been producing these uh, milk saw their sales go down <laughs> significantly. So the state responded with a new food safety law um, saw punitive measures against some key perpetrators in the industry. Um, it revised several industry regulations and called for an overhaul of the dairy value chain. Okay, so a couple of the models that they introduced um, 
were more integrated models. Essentially, they wanted to move from the outsourcing model to models that consolidated farmers and provided more control over the milk production process. So there was various steps of this from sort of, I think actually you were talking about some middle, medium scale integrated models to full, fully vertically integrated large scale ranch models. Um, so in this middle model, which is called Yangzhou Shaoqi, or also some of the Hezhuoshe, which is uh, cooperative, um, or Zhuonyoshe, these are all different types of physically consolidated <laughs> models where rural farmers were actually brought onto the same land uh, and put in standardized barns and feedlots um, under the management of one zone owner. And then from there, of course, you had the rest of the chain, the collection truck comes, the milk goes to the processor, and then on to the urban consumer. Okay, so here is a picture. Um, this is a, I call them raisin bins, there's many names, uh, younger Shaoqi in Inner Mongolia. You can see the sort of standardized barns, and then way down at the end of that road uh, is the milk station. Okay, and then the second model uh, I mentioned is the large-scale ranch model. So it's like Wan Tou Mu Fang, um, which could reach, so that's 10,000 head farm. Uh, they usually range from about 500 cows to 10,000 cows, although they didn't usually reach the 10,000 mark. Um, in this model, you actually didn't have rural farmers anymore. You actually had rural workers um, who were in, at the ranch, working with the cows in the cattle barn and the milk parlor, but all under the ownership of one investor person company. Um, and that could have that could have been a processor invested large scale ranch, it could be a privately invested, it could be the local government. I'm gonna, I, you probably noticed some of the exact lines around the models. I'm gonna get into that in a second. <laughs> um, and here is a picture of one of them in Inner Mongolia. This is a, 10,000 head farm, although it actually only has 5,000. Um, very shiny, uh, very high tech. So this is a rotary milking machine. Um, they all have the latest technology. Um, and of course, um, a crucial thing to mention about these models is they're actually not new. They were introduced as early as 2000 in the dairy industry. Um, and they have experienced significant challenges both before and after the melamine incident. Um, so one of the first challenges, and I think again, this is one of the things you mentioned, where smallholders have resisted movement into raising zones and cooperatives for a couple of key reasons. Number one, they're not providing economic incentives for smallholders to move into them. Number two, they're not providing economies of scale. Often smallholders, while physically consolidated, are not actually integrated. <laughs> um, they are raising their own cows, they're feeding them with their own feed, um, and often they're in conflict with the zone owner and with other farmers at times. Um, the large-scale ran ranches also had significant problems um, and were often economically and environmentally unsustainable. Um, instead, serving as space projects for both company and local government. So for the company, it looked, I mean, these farms, they're demonstration sites. They make consumers feel very safe. They look high tech. Um, and then for the local government, it looks like they're achieving various production objectives. Um, they also look very nice. But in reality, they're extremely expensive. Um, and in a, Mo in a Mongolia where you have land and water um, constraints, uh, they're very, very hard to maintain. And so for many reasons, many of these farms only have half of what they might say they have or none at all or never be constructed. Um, so in the end, these, these chains couldn't guarantee higher yields and they couldn't guarantee improved milk quality, um, and as such, processors continue to rely on the lower cost outsourcing model. And this is from 2000 all the way through the melamine incident and after. Um, okay, so when you continue to have these challenges, 
and you've seen food safety issues one after another. Um, and in particular with the dairy industry, melamine resurfaced a couple times after the main incident uh, and led people to ask, well, okay, so why all these food safety issues in China? And often they tend to blame two separate sets of actors. They tend to look at the state and say, okay, there's not the proper re regulatory framework. We don't have enough laws. They're not strong enough. They're not being enforced. Or they look at industry and they say, there aren't enough governance strategi strategies being introduced into the value chains. There isn't the correct model of organization. Um, but in China, actually, we shouldn't separate these two frameworks because the state plays a huge role inside of value chains. So it shouldn't be seen as an actor that acts outside, but an actor that acts inside. Um, and so much of my PhD research focused on the state business interaction uh, in the dairy industry and how this led to particular food safety outcomes. Um, all right, so let me go through a couple of um, these state activities in the value chain in order to show how critical the institutional environment is to food safety issues. Um, Number one, at the very, very beginning, I was talking about central objectives, and that really led to exactly how the dairy industry was organized. Um, second, we have political and economic incentives for local industry development. Now, I'm not going to get into these, but you have the CALFA, which is the cadre evaluation system, which sets up targets for local political leaders. Um, you have subsidies from the central uh, subsidies in the dairy industry uh, that are dispersed and central transfers. Um, you also have direct engagement in the value chain. So this is actually, I'm gonna go back. These are all those dotted lines I had. I'll start with the outsourcing model. Okay, so milk stations could be owned by local government agencies. They could be managed by local government employees. They could also be managed by private investors. They could be managed by a number of different people. Um, the processor could also be owned by the municipal government or privately invested. Um, you're starting to see that there's some overlap with between regulators and regulated um, and also conflicting objectives between industry and agriculture, between farmers and processors. So then when you fast forward to the integrated model, um, you see here the local government agencies are still involved in the new integrated model. So are the private investors, so is the municipal government. Um, and then you get to the large scale ranches and you still have the municipal government and its interests at the sort of last stop before consumers. Um, let's go then here. Okay, so you have ownership, investment in, and or management of processors, co cooperatives, milk stations, and bull stations. I mean, this is replicated throughout every single input in the dairy industry. Um, you also had industry associations that weren't really able to play a third party role. They're frequently associated with a ministry or with the local government. Um, so that sort of ruled out that type of regulation. Um, you also had party committees with firms, which served as another link back into the local state. Okay, so sort of overview of what happens if you have conflicts of interest between, you know, two people who are playing dual roles as regulator and player. You're having competing objectives between industry and agriculture. You have opportunities for distorted development and misappropriated funds often the large scale ranches, um, and you have limited third party regulation. So in sum, um, integrated models were intended to improve coordination and control in the dairy value chain. Instead, they posed risks for rural development objectives. So this is like for the environment with the large scale ranches actually weren't environmentally sustainable. And for rural incomes, because actually the Yangzhou Xiaoqi and the Hezhuoshe were actually providing uh, an economic incentive and boosting rural incomes as they said that they would. And of course, you had problems, continued problems with food safety, and really processors and several actors along the chain were unable to govern for food safety because of these 
conflicts of interest and competing objectives. Um, so together, uh, Derry's regulatory challenges stemmed from structural issues in the way that the state interacted with business and not necessarily from a lack of appropriate legislation or value chain modeling. Uh, obviously, this has big implications for China um, and for the US and for international uh, and in the international scene. Uh, to Im improve food safety and ensure the dairy industry's sustainable development, you must first consider the state business relationships through which legal and value chain solutions are oper operationali operationalized. So before we even introduce food safety legislation and consider different value chain models, we need to think about what types of actors are playing in these systems and what their incentives and their objectives are um, and what sort of political economy is running this industry. Um, there are, of course, uh, the, s the Chinese state has introduced some efforts that I think might prove effective. Um, in 2012, they, for the first time, inserted food safety into the CALHA, into the cadre evaluation system, which specifically directed local officials toward looking at food safety and seeing food safety as part of their portfolio. Um, you've seen increased central transfers into the into local areas for the dairy industry. Um, Costco purchased a majority state stake in Mongmyo, and you're seeing decentralization of some dairy in, uh, dairy companies, and also fiscal recentralization and direct of interest to division of counties. Uh, now I know that Susan will probably be getting into this, so it might serve as a nice uh, transition. <laughs> Uh, but of course, the U.S. is very interested in food safety in issues in China. I believe that we import over 10 billion in agricultural products. Um, we opened our first foreign office in Beijing in 2009, immediately following the Melanin incident. Um, I have seen that they've increased their funding in order to triple their staff. Um, you also have these sort of tandem policies in China going on of which is the idea of, okay, um, we need to invite foreign agribusiness companies into China, mutual learning, we need technology and expertise, but ultimately we want to see domestic dairy brands succeed. Um, at the same time, especially in high land and water use industries like dairy, like beef, um, you're starting to see, well, maybe it would be best if we went out, so to to you. <laughs> Uh, and purchase foreign agricultural goods, inputs, and companies and other assets uh, abroad. And you're starting to see this a bit in New Zealand, Australia. Uh, I believe there's going to be a new farm built in Russia. Um, so yeah, that's it. And I think segue. All right. Yes, good segue. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and I'm glad that you know that you did mention. I think in the Q and A we can talk. You know, this year. We think, you never know, that, that there's supposed to be amendments to the food safety law. And I don't know, but as you were talking, that so much of, so much of you talked about, Sabrina, is, is like the story of the state and the business integrated. It's a, it's, a, it's a deja vu in a lot of the industrial sector as well and why we get bad integration, bad, bad environmental quality. All right, Susan, you ready to rock and roll? There you go. Great. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much um, for this opportunity. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank our two fabulous research assistants, Elaria and Sharon, who are doing a great job with the event logistics. Um, so as Sabrina put it very well, um, I'll be transitioning talking about what China's growing appetite means for U.S. agriculture. Um, and as Shri Hua mentioned, you know, there are environmental concerns and how that's impacting the food supply. And then as Sabrina mentioned, um, there's the more intentional adulteration of food, such as the melanin milk scandal. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, you know, as Chinese people are, are demanding more U.S. food, what does that mean for um, U.S. agriculture, everything from food companies such as McDonald's to U.S. agribusiness down to um, individual U.S. farmers. Okay, so this is just a brief outline of my presentation. I'll start off by talking about um, trends in U.S. agriculture exports to China, and I'm going to do that um, by telling you a story about the Port of Oakland. Um, I went out to Oakland, California last month, funded by the Luce Foundation. Um, 
I'll talk about that in a minute. And then secondly, I'll move on to talk about drivers of Chinese demand for U.S. agricultural products. Um, and then lastly, I will talk about opportunities and challenges for U.S. agriculture. Um, you might be wondering uh, who this man is. Um, most of you probably don't know who he is. Uh, for now, you can just know that his name is Farmer Peter, and we will be talking about him later on in the presentation, so stay tuned. Okay, so here is a map of the Port of Oakland. Um, how many of you have been to Oakland before? Anybody? Oh, okay, quite a few. So it's a little south of San Francisco. I was actually born um, in Oakland. Um, and so you're probably wondering why I went to Oakland. Well, I thought, well, what better way to understand how China's rising demand for food is transforming the U.S. agriculture sector than to go to the place where a lot of the agricultural foods in the U.S., whether it's grain, whether it's meat, soybeans, are actually being exported outside of this port. So I wanted to see, is the port being impacted? Um, and so I went there and I spoke with the marketing manager, Beth Frischer there, um, and she told me about some huge um, infrastructure development projects that they are putting on in order to link the U.S. Farm Belt in the Midwest to China. So there's two projects in particular. Um, so one is uh, a cold chain storage that they're building. I just spoke with her yesterday and they just signed the papers. Um, construction will begin in the spring of 2017. It's a $90 million project. Um, and so as you can imagine, a lot of this food from the Midwest, whether it's pork or, or vegetables, they need to be frozen. So when they arrive at the port and are being prepared to ship, they need to maintain temperature control. So that's what the cold uh, chain storage is for. Um, the second here is a grain transload operation. Um, so what that means is in the U.S. we use these big 53-foot containers, but internationally in the shipping business they use 40-foot containers. So what happens is for instance, if soybean is shipped from the Midwest, it might um, come in by rail on these 53-foot containers that needs to be transloaded into 40-foot containers before it can be put onto the ship. Um, so what she told me is that the demand they are seeing from China for grain, for animal feed, is massive, massive, and she said that it can simply cannot be overstated. So she gave me an example. Right now, while they're waiting for this grain transload operation to be built, they actually um, have contracted out to a company called Capital River Group. And Capital River Group has um, a grain transload operation somewhere around here. And they just recently presented to the Board of Oakland that they are planning to double in size because of the demand that they are seeing from China. So there is huge business opportunities. Um, so let's take a look at the numbers. So um, the, to uh, the Port of Oakland's top three trading partners, um, first is China, second is Japan, and third is Korea. Now, there, I think there's two things that we can tell from this data here that I think is um, pretty interesting. So the first is looking at the overall trading volume. The units here are TEUs, um, which is stands for 20-foot equivalent units. So essentially what it is is a 20-foot container. Um, and this is data from 2014. So, okay, again, the first is if you look at China, the total trading volume that it has with the Port of Oakland is over four times that of what it has with, uh, the Port of Oakland has with Japan. Um, so there's a huge difference and that gap is only increasing. Next, what's really interesting is um, they gave me data and then I just, I, I calculated out the net. So, um, you know, you take the the exports from Port of Oakland to China and then subtract imports from China into Port of Oakland, you see that for China it's, it's positive, um, but then you look at Japan and Korea and it's negative. So what that means essentially is that the Port of Oakland is exporting more to China than it's importing. And that's very interesting because it is one of the few U.S. ports where that is the case because it's, as you can imagine, you know, whether you go to the store like this weekend, I went to Crate and Barrel, you know, <laughs> pretty much everything's made in China, right? So you have all, you know, whether it's forks or you have Barbies or toys, you know, there's so many things that we're importing into the U.S. from China. So a lot of what you're seeing here is driven by those agricultural um, exports. 
All right. So these are two statistics that I just, you know, I, I think are somewhat mind boggling. Um, the first is that U.S. agricultural sales, um, as I think Sabrina alluded to, to China doubled during the period of 2004 to 2008. And then it doubled again during the period from 2008 to 2012, actually hitting $26 billion in annual sales. And interestingly enough, that number is more than 10 times of what it was in the late 1990s. Um, and then secondly, you may or may not know that China is the largest overseas market for U.S. farm products. Um, it was number four in 2008. In 2008, it was Japan and then Mexico and then Canada and then China. But now China is, has surpassed all three countries and is the top destination for U.S. Uh, farm products. Okay, so here's um, an infographic, which speaking of our interns, one of our fabulous interns, Suki Han, who's now a grad student at Duke University, um, did a series of infographics for us. And this one depicts the interlinked, interconnected food, um, the US-China food trade. But what I really want to zoom in on is um, this little pie graph here, which I've blown up here. Um, <laughs> so what you can see, okay, so what this pie graph is, um, the U.S. major agricultural exports to China in 2013. And what you can see is almost half of this pie chart is for soybeans. Um, and that's because soybeans are um, used to produce animal feed, which is fed to um, uh, animals that the Chinese people will then eat. And so soybeans... Cute cows. Yes, and the cute cows. Yes, the cute cows that Sabrina showed. Um, so soybeans are actually the largest U.S. export of any type. We're not just talking about agriculture, but across the board. It's the largest export that, um, from the U.S. to China, and it actually accounts for 11% of the value of all U.S. exports to China. So it's huge. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what's driving this. And I think um, Dr. Zhang did a great job. Um, actually, I just realized I'm surrounded by three doctors here. I'm the only one without a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I defer questions to them. Um, so the first is um, limited farmland. And so both Sabrina and um, Dr. Zhang um, uh, talked about that. So if you look at the World Bank data, China has 0 0.08 hectares of farmland per person, whereas in the U.S. there's 0 0.49 hectares per person. So in the U.S. we have more than six times the amount of farmland on average per person. Um, and then exacerbating that is a lot of the farmland in China is becoming polluted. And so, of course, that's an issue as well. So um, the second sort of driver for increasing U.S. agricultural exports to China is, um, in China, rising income, growing middle class, and what that translates is to rising demand for meat. So whereas Chinese people in the past might have only eaten um, meat occasionally a few times a year, um, you know, now it's, they're, they're eating it, you know, on a regular basis. My mom reminds me all the time that she only used to eat meat once a year during Chinese New Year, so. <laughs> um, and what that means is there's an increase in terms of the direct meat imports from U.S. So that's one way. But then the other, as we've already discussed, is um, soybean exports to China. Um, a third driver um, is developed. Um, a lot of Chinese people are being exposed to different cuisines and developing um, Western tastes. And as Sabrina mentioned, part of that was, you know, driven by this state um, initiative to to increase the dairy industry domestically, but also part of that is because a lot of Chinese people are traveling abroad, and um, as I was telling Jennifer, you know, so some Chinese people, they go to France, they try brie cheese, and then they come back to China, and they think, oh, I really like the taste of this. Um, so they, you know, there there is this increasing demand for these luxury or higher value added agricultural products. And then lastly, as we've discussed, um, safer food. Uh, you know, China's been rocked from milk or food scandal after food scandal. And as Sabrina mentioned, you know, the 2008 melamine milk scandal was um, unfortunately a very big one. Okay, so um, I just want to show graphs for in terms of these trends. So looking at what we talked about earlier in terms of Western taste, um, what this graph shows is China's imports of select uh, processed food products. Um, and that's cheese, cookies, bread and pastries, um, coffee and tea and ice cream. So what you can see is from 2000, there's a huge growth in the amount of imports for cheese, for cookies, bread and pastries, um, coffee and tea and ice cream. 
and then in terms of the trend, demand for safer food, um, so as Sabrina, you know, talked about, so we, what this so shows here is China's dairy imports from 2000 to 2013. And you can see just how dramatic of a growth there is in imports after the 2008 Melanie milk scandal. It just goes up and up and up. Um, so what does this mean for U.S. agriculture? Well, clearly there are huge business opportunities. So this is a graph and all of these, um, you know, I took from USDA, so thank them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is China's agricultural imports by supplying country. The red line is the United States. Um, the next line is Brazil. Um, and what you see is United States is the clear leader in terms of supplying agricultural goods to China. But what I thought was really interesting is you can see that in particular, the US and Brazil have very similar sort of trend lines. Whereas Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and Argentina, they're growing, but not at the same pace. And a lot of that, it, again, is being driven by soybeans, because those of you who probably know that Brazil is a huge producer of soybeans. OK, so I also want to talk about um, you know, other opportunities other just than the, the straight sort of food exports to, to China, because um, there are other opportunities for U.S. businesses um, that I want to talk about. And so up here is a photo of um, uh, President Xi Jinping, and this photo was taken in 2012 when he was still vice president. And here he's visiting um, Iowa, and I don't know if you can see, but he's, this is a John Deere tractor, and this is for a photo op that he's doing. He's getting out of this John Deere tractor. And um, as I know Jennifer has experienced in a lot of sort of uh, private talks with um, various companies, what we have found out is that um, China is increasingly shifting its grain belt to the northeast. So kind of like Sabrina was mentioning, um, in particular for the grain belt, the three provinces of Liaoning province, um, Jilin and Heilongjiang. And interestingly enough, 80% of the combines, so combines are these machines that harvest grain, 80% of those combines are imported through a port in Liaoning province, Dalian. And most of those combines are made in the United States and directly exported to China. So huge opportunities for um, US agricultural machinery. And then over here, um, and again, this ties in well with Sabrina's presentation, um, back in 2013, you might have heard um, about um, Smithfield, which is the US, um, United States largest pork producer. It was bought out in 2013 by a Chinese company called WH Group. And there was a lot of controversy um, over that. And you know, I'm not speaking for or against this acquisition. Um, but just to say that while a lot of the conversation was surrounding, um, you know, people are saying, oh, well, all of our pork is going to be taken from the U.S. and shipped to China, um, one of the things that really was lost in the conversation that Sabrina had mentioned was that really probably in some ways the biggest driving factor for WH Group to buy out Smithfield was not necessarily for the meat itself, but for the technological know-how and the managerial expertise, especially as China is transitioning from these smallholder farms, like Sabrina mentioned, her statistic that 80% of these dairy farmers have less than 20 cows. So China is in the process of transitioning to these much larger operations. And so they're trying to learn from the US model of um, large confined animal uh, feeding operations. How you do it, how do you do it safely, how do you do it in a way that's a relatively environmentally sustainable. Okay, now of course with everything, in addition to ch um, opportunities, there are of course huge challenges for um, U.S. agriculture. Um, you know, one of the things that has come up in conversations that Jennifer and I have had with some U.S. food companies is, um, you know, they they're audited more often, or at least that's the perception. Um, they have, you know, government regulators that are checking on them, breathing down their backs. Um, so that's one issue. Um, another issue is differing phytosanitary standards. And again, um, as Sabrina had mentioned, you know, that's, that's very common. You know, every country has different standards. But what's difficult with China is sometimes it's not clear whether it's really sort of out of the safety um, reason. So for instance, when it was banning US imports of beef or um, various fruits or even DDGs, which is a component for animal feed, it's not always clear whether it's really a food safety issue or is it part of a larger sort of trade negotiation or political tactic. And then um, another issue um, is 
which probably the two other speakers could probably speak to it even better, is um, China's policies um, based on their self-sufficiency goals. So um, China has always wanted to maintain a certain level of self-sufficiency, particularly in grain. China has a strategic pork reserve, like the U.S. has a strategic oil reserve. So they see this as very much part of a national security issue. And so, you know, depending on how their policies change, of course, that will impact um, the way that a U.S. company can strategically plan um, in terms of entering or expanding its market in China. But to bring this down more to an individual level, I wanted to talk about a specific farmer who, um, as you saw earlier, is here, Farmer Peter. So <laughs> does anyone know what, what's going on in this photo? Great. All right, well. She has <laughs> succeeded answered. in stumping you. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> seems like Sabrina, um, I guess that's why you're a speaker here. <laughs> so uh, Sabrina, um, as Sabrina said, this is um, the IPO of Alibaba. Who here has heard of Alibaba? I think probably yeah, everyone. Rich. Okay, so Alibaba is essentially an e-commerce platform that um, allows business to business or business to consumer or consumer to consumer sales. And um, it went IPO in, I believe, September of last year. And what was interesting is instead of having Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, ring the bell, the opening bell at New York uh, Stock Exchange, um, they chose eight of Alibaba's uh, customers. And so here are all of these seven Chinese people. And then there's <laughs> Farmer Peter right here, which <laughs> I thought was very interesting. And it. I What's very interesting, I was very interested to know why did they choose a cherry farmer? Peter is, um, Peter Verbruvi is his name. He is a cherry farmer from Washington State. He has a farm in Wapato, Washington. He is a third generation farmer. So he farms on the same land that his grandfather farmed on. Um, his family started farming in the 1930s and uh, he grew up on the farm and he started farming since he was a child. So, um, actually, last year I had tried to contact him to talk with him, but he told me that unfortunately all of Alibaba said that all media requests had to go through them because he was getting so many, but things have calmed down now. So, um, I called him yesterday <laughs> and spoke to him, and I wanted to get his insight. I wanted to know from his perspective what are the opportunities and challenges for a U.S. farmer like him. Um, so, the, the backstory is he um, sold cherries through Tmall. Um, so he would have his cherries directly shipped um, to consumers in, in China. So um, this is what he told me. So here he is with uh, his cherries. Um, <laughs> so I asked him first to go through, you know, some of the opportunities that he sees. So first, you know, he mentioned the growing middle class um, to buy, you know, his products, which are positioned on the higher end of retail scale over there. I mean, cherries, as you probably know, even in the U.S. are pretty expensive at Safeway. It's $5.99 per pound. This week, it's $2.99. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <so, laughs> um, but they're very expensive overseas. My dad visited from Taiwan last week, and the first thing he wanted when he got off the plane was he wanted to go buy cherries because they're so expensive in Asia. So for, for him, it's a great market. Um, it commands a very high price overseas. The second opportunity, he said, was um, he started talking to me about his Fuji apple. So in addition to cherries, he also exports Fuji apples to Asia. And what he told me is, um, you might not know that China is actually the largest apple producer in the entire world. And he told me that he has eaten apples that are produced in China. And he says he doesn't know why, but they taste different, and they just do not compare to our U.S. apples. It just doesn't <laughs> have the level of flavor. Um, and, you know, whether or not that, that's true, I mean, there certainly is a demand for that. So part of it is product differentiation. And then lastly, he touched on the food safety component. Um, and he was clear to say, you know, you can, food is not always, it, there's no way for it to be 100% safe. But what he said is they, they, as in the Chinese people, know they can trust U.S. products as much as you can trust any product you put in your mouth. Um, okay, so then, um, I asked him to talk a little bit about his challenges. So I, I went on Google Maps and just took, um, you know, inserted in directions how long it takes from <laughs> Wapato, Washington <laughs> to Beijing, 14 hours and 40 minutes on the flight. So his first major challenge, what she said, is the logistics. So from the time somebody places an order on Tmall, he has 56 to 72 hours, he said, 
to pick the cherries off the tree, to cool them, to pack them, to get them on a truck, to get it on the highway to the airport in Seattle and get it on a plane. He says if anything happens, if there's a wreck on the highway and his truck is delayed, he misses the shipment right there. So it's very difficult logistically. Um, and he actually spent a lot of time talking about how important U.S. infrastructure is to farmers, that highways are built, railways, all of that access is very important for them to be able to get their food fresh to China. Secondly, he talked about culture <laughs> and positioning. And he said, understanding where my product is positioned and why. And what he told me is that he takes annual trips to China because he says he wants to be able to look at his buyers eye to eye. Um, and he said that, <laughs> it was interesting, he said it's very easy on the phone to pretend like you're a buyer. And he says he goes over there first so that he can understand how does his product stack up in terms of pricing to other imported fruit, um, to domestically produced fruit, what are the facilities that his buyers have. But also he said he wanted to make sure that um, you know, his cherries aren't being sold out of a closet. So <laughs> 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 that was really interesting. And then lastly, um, the slowing Chinese economy. So you've probably read in the news that the stock market crashed. Um, this is probably the most fascinating part of the conversation. So he told me that beginning a year ago, he had a sense that the Chinese economy was slowing down based on his cherry sales. So he <laughs> said <laughs> how, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the Financial Times about the housing bubble. So he told me, he literally said, he sensed there was a cherry bubble. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, that there was, he could sense that there was a fervor around cherry buying, and he did not think that it could be sustained. And lo and behold, he was correct. Before any of the other financial analysts could suspect it, he knew that the Chinese economy was slowing down. So he's actually seen, starting a year ago, his cherry, so the past five years, he said his cherry sales were just skyrocketing, and then they started to plateau. So basically, I think if we need investment advice, talk to a cherry farmer. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, all that said, you know, there's lots of opportunities, but clearly there are a lot of challenges, which, you know, I think Sabrina and Shrihua, you know, having all done all the sort of more on the ground work, you could talk about probably in more detail. Um, and so for U.S. companies, there's a lot to navigate in terms of the various intricacies and blind spots. Um, so there are a lot of issues. Um, we can certainly talk about. I mean, I don't have like the perfect answer, but we can certainly, you know, Jennifer and I can talk about some potential solutions that, you know, we've thought of as we've met with U.S. food companies who have come to us for, um, you know, just brainstorming ideas. Um, but, you know, I think we can leave that yeah. for the Q&A. All so right. Thank you guys so much. So applause here. <laughs> and see, I love, see, I love my job. Do you like these? We, I mean, they, they kind of, we, I told them each other they were talking on email, but, you know, Shui was traveling. But what, what happens a lot, the, your talks kind of wove together. You all had pictures of a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> um, each more charismatic than the next. Um, so let's take some questions here. So that, that but you know, so we did, we covered l a lot of ground from Chengdu to Inner Mongolia to a cherry farmer in Oregon. But there's a lot of inner linkages here. So give us some questions. Make sure when you, when you raise your hand and you get the mic that you say your name and where you work. And does, let's ask some quick questions. And all right. They're shocked. Questions, comments? There we go at the end of the table. Yeah, Ken Meyer, Gord, uh, retired. Uh, concerning American export, agricultural exports to China, is China all concerned about GMOs? Is China yeah. concerned about GMOs? Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. I think yeah. You, it seems like yeah. you've, got, you've got it okay. answered the first time. Um, I think there's uh, um, GMO is very controversial in China. And in my view, it's become more political now. So people take stand. And without knowing much about what GMO really means, actually, in my view, okay, we are, uh, I'm on the WeChat all the time, so we kind of <laughs> posting that stuff all the time. I'm, I'm on the anti-GMO camp. But still, I think China's discussion is just not rational. So it's a lot looking at what GMO means, the different type of GMOs, and uh, what is happening in the U.S. and what is happening in Europe. So basically, I think the Chinese concern because somehow a couple years ago they start, uh, I think, circulating saying it's banned in the U.S., it's banned in Europe, and then the information become more clear. It's not banned in the U.S., and then now you see the recent announcement, uh, even not mandatory anymore about the labeling. So I think the uh, Chinese is getting different, in a way, it's confusing information. 
about what's happening in other countries because they look at the U.S. and Europe as a model. That if the things are not happening there, it must be bad. The same things are happening there, it must be good. So my friend who actually just gave a talk actually in China about the GMO, and she said it was very well received because she was saying about Europe. You know, in Europe, they are not really used for food. They are used for agriculture, I heard that. So not for human consumption. But when another friend, when they're talking about the U.S., what's happening in the U.S., that was not very well received because they're basically saying it's all over the place in the U.S. I mean, everybody, you know, the food is the market of everything. So I would say it's very concerned. But I don't think there is clear information. Particularly, government is also internally taking a stand. If you're talking to different departments, they say different things. So it's confusing, in my view. Thank you. Okay. Um, you're right here. And if just wait for the mic to come. I have questions, too. But I'll let the audience jump in first. Hi, thanks, everybody. Um, great, 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 great presentation. Better than I've seen in a long time. My name is Virginia Cutchin. I'm an independent intercultural trainer and consultant. And I specialize in China. I was in China twice recently, well, once in Chengdu, once in Beijing, recently with a, with a delegation on um, uh, concern about uh, specifically water quality and uh, equipment manufacturers and all of that. Um, my question is, I feel, and I share the opinion of many who feel that we live in a country here in the U.S. that encourages overconsumption and uh, entertainment. We're addicted to entertainment and overconsumption and convenience. But knowing how much water it takes to produce meat and knowing that China has consumption goals but it also has environmental protection goals, what's your sense of Chinese people's awareness of the dangers of overconsumption and getting into, I think I'll <laughs> see the look on your face, I'll stop there. Thank you. So, so kind of looking at the, that, that meat, meat consumption is driving their, their environmental footprint, hoof print, <laughs> and, and, you know, and the water. So do you want to make some comments about, is there an awareness of it? Well, it's, very, it's a very good question, really. I think that because I'm not living in China for three years, make a huge difference to me. It really depends who you talk to. I think overall, everybody concerned. Like the PX project in Chengdu just happened. I was on the WeChat 24 hours, trying to figure out what's happening in the backyard of my country. So I think the issue is here. Everybody concerned, but not everybody makes that linkage. What are they consumed, actually? That's what are they, which, which means that the victim, but also the problem uh, makers. Not many Chinese recognize that. But if you're talking to like my friends, everybody in this field, or very well educated people, then they are concerned and they also kind of recognize overconsumption is a problem, right? So I think it very much depends who you talk to and whether they're actually affected directly by the pollution. All right, it's like you talk to the people in Chengdu right now, everybody's going to say, is the number one. We can sacrifice everything if we can get rid of that factory. Because that's huge, and it exploded the, big, uh, the PX project. Uh, that city is gone, pretty much. So I think it really depends on where you go, who you talk to, and whether that determine whether or not they make a linkage. But whether the con overconsumption actually is the root cause of this whole problem, and the China is going down that way still. Okay, it's all development-based. They are not turning around yet, and uh, even though there are lots of concern about it. So I think I would say live there, it depends. But in terms of meat, I mean, per capita, yeah. Chinese are still, I mean, while their overall amount of meat has gone up phenomenally, but per capita, Chinese consume still much less than we do, right? About a quarter of our per capita. So, it's a, so that makes it, I think, kind of hard to make that connection, too, because it's like, hey, you know. Not that much yet. <laughs> not that much yet, but, it's, but I mean, the trend is upward. But again, everything in China, you know, what, what, oh, that, uh, the one quote about everything, you know, anything times 1.25 billion is a hell of a lot. Remember <laughs> our, the, our, who, our, Lester Brown, he said that at a meeting here last year. It's like, funny guy. Um, Sabrina? I, I was just going to add on to that. I mean, dairy uses a lot of water yeah. as well. Um, and what you were just saying with consumption, I mean, dairy consumption is still far below the sort of average of, Europe, United States, mm -hmm. other dairy consuming countries. Um, so in that regard, yeah, I'm, there's absolutely consumer awareness about environmental issues. I don't think there's detailed information on specific industries. And I'm, again, as 
both of us mentioned during our presentations, there's a huge disconnect between consumers and farmers. So I think a lot of the practices, whether it's water, soil, fertilizer, I mean, pesticides, antibiotics, all of this is not in front of the consumer, and it's not the images that they typically see um, in the media and what they associate with these products. But there's also telling, because I think you, bo you two both made the comment that farmers that they're not all, you know, they have their own plot of food that yeah, they grow yeah, without yeah. the oh. pesticides. I, I remember hearing that um, before the melamine incident, and this is like a sort of famous quotation, but um, that they, you know, farmers in, in Kobe had stopped drinking milk like three years before yeah. the melamine incident. But that, just to want to clarify uh, on your melamine incident thing, because you had all those pictures, but the melamine was put in at the processing stage. Oh, yes. You should, oh, I, I was yes. expecting like a big red star, like danger. Apologies for not mentioning that. Actually, it was put in at many different stages along that long chain that I showed you. So it was added at the milk station <gasps> into that single tank that I told you. That's actually the main point. But the farmers is. didn't do it. No. So in the outsourcing mo model, rural farmers did not have access to their own milk. I mean, essentially, they hooked up that claw that you saw in the central milk station, and the milk was carried into a central tank. Then the processor sent its collection truck, or individual entrepreneurs came with their motorcycles, with their um, lorries, um, and collected the milk, and then resold it to processors. Um, it was added at the collection truck stage. It was also added at the processor stage. And even if it wasn't added at the processor stage, the processors knew that it was in the milk and continued to put that milk into production. So, mm. everywhere. <laughs> We're getting depressing again. <laughs> Some questions in the back, and or anyway, right here. Whoever who you can grab, name, quick affiliation, quick question. Here we go. Um, my name is Zoe Liu. I'm a researcher working at the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, I have a question um, for uh, Dr. Zhang and Susan about the price of the food. Um, so the first question is in Chengdu for those like pilot programs. You have you mentioned like few of your friends would like to pay for the food because of a lot. Of lot of the reasons. I wonder if cost, if price is one of the reasons, and if, if it, it is, how much ex uh, how much more expensive um, compared to the average, you know, vegetables and fruit in the market. And also, uh, for Susan, like, the cherries from Farmer Peter, like, I think his cherries are sold in the high-end retail store yeah. stores. I wonder, like, what's the price difference compared to the, you know, other other cherries like available in the mar market that are produced like domestically in China, um, and also another question is: Is it possible that you know the Chengdu farmers who are doing this organic farming can also sell their product uh, through Alibaba.com? Okay, good one. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so the first question um, in terms of, you know, how are his, his prices, I actually don't know exactly, so I don't want to, you know, compare to some of the others. Um, and then I think your other question was, in oh, could it be produced domestically? I don't know. I mean, from my understanding, there's not a – cherries? There's some in China. There's some, but they're not at nearly the sort of the same quality I don't think that you can get in the U.S. So I think that, again, is sort of the product differentiation. And as you mentioned, I mean, certainly the people who are consuming his uh, cherries are definitely high end. So he actually sells to wholesalers um, who then will sell to, for instance, um, you know, at the time when I lived in Beijing, there was like Jenny Lou's, so these sort of foreign supermarkets. Um, and so that's something that's interesting. In some other countries, such as Korea, he's directly selling to retail store, but he's se selling to very specific distributors who then sell to these you know, supermarkets that are meant for foreigners or very wealthy Chinese. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, I think I can speak for them, also the cherries, because it just happened in China recently. I think when they first came out, I remember the price from 30 yuan per tin all the way to 120. I believe that 120 is from the Peter. <laughs> 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 but it tastes quite different, I have to conve <laughs> confess, because when I first looked at that, I thought I just looked at it, and you know, I mean, it's like a decimal is wrong. I said, it's 12 yuan or 200, <laughs> 120, <laughs> 120. But it tastes not better, for sure, than the uh, 20, 30 ones. But it is expensive, so, so having said that, then in terms of the price for organic farming, particularly, I mean, over in China, not only in Chengdu, just take that as an example. I would say, speaking of like uh, the vegetables, I get a five-gene vegetable, 30 yuan, 
Okay, 30 yuan for five jeans, so we collect six pounds, close to six pounds. And uh, if you, so here's a different part, difficult part, because most the vegetable, vegetables produced by the farmers are kind of cheap ones. You know what I'm saying? That some of the vegetables are not more expensive, and, but generally are not quite local. And uh, did you get that idea? So it's, even, even though the price itself is not that expensive compared with the market, they probably double the price. But it's the uh, type of the vegetables that doesn't worth that much. So that's a problem. You don't get a variety. So it's, a com so it's like bai cai or? Yeah, bai cai or wo sun. <laughs> so you don't get a like the jiu cai hua, you know, for example. So <laughs> you don't get those, like even it's hard to get the, I remember, you know, when there's only one farmer, the, uh, the guy I put a picture there, Wang Chen. So he has a da pong, you know, this kind of greenhouse. So he was able to produce tomatoes. And I remember every single time I got from him, it was tiny. So it was like a half a pound, not even. All right, but that's expensive, but tastes just like what I got from California. I was really happy. <laughs> I called him and said, can I just pay more money? Can I get like a two or three pounds? I love it. But the people I talked to, like my friends, and everybody's family income was at least 300,000 RMB a year, okay, at least in Chengdu. That's a well-to-do family. They definitely can afford that, okay? I spend uh, probably like s somewhere uh, around 6,000 RMB on food. Not only on vegetables, uh, you know, other things. And uh, I mean, that together was like $70,000, as I mean, be talking about. For those families, they should be able to afford it. I the problem is not so much about the price, in my view. What about, what about the question of, um, it's like your vegetables when you're connecting the consumers that, I mean, do you have some kind of, there's a lot of different certification systems in China. <laughs> He's like, oh, she's like, no, don't ask that question. <laughs> I'm asking the question. Okay, you can um, ask that question. <laughs> but they, if the, you watch what I, I, think, I don't think people track well, that. Yeah, that's just it. I mean, but but your but your farmers. I mean, are they that using no, any kind of like? Long. See, that's the thing. That's the next thing we could work on. That is, how do we develop like a sort of long official certification process? Keep us trust. Like some organization is doing those things, but currently it's all by government, and uh, people don't really trust it. The reason people go into this farm like me or my some of my friends because we know them. We go there once a month. We see how they're being produced. I'm personally even involved. I'm doing another project for them. So I had that trust. So I think the organic farming, those kind of thing, in China is facing that difficulty. Is that this sort of, con uh, what's it called, uh, the trust, I think, how that passed along. People start trusting in the farmers, which you probably don't know, who you don't know, but you still think the food is good. So we don't have that mechanism there. Because, yeah. because there's lots of, there's a lot of examples. I've had meetings, you know, when I did this a lot in 2006, 7, 8, 9, there's a lot of fake, Organic yeah. food, yeah, like yeah. like Miyun Sheku, the Miyun Reservoir. There's yeah. supposedly like it's all organic around it. The <laughs> water from the Miyun Reservoir supplies, you know, the high, you know, rich people in Beijing, right? And so there's this belt of organic food, and once you know, and that food is often also sold to high-level officials and whatnot. And then I've, I've heard that there was suddenly all this, all these veggies in Beijing were all called Miyun Reservoir vegetables. <laughs> You're like, really? How big is Miyun Sheku? Um, but so. And so, but so, but the, but the issue of trust is it's not it's you know I mean it, it's it's it, I mean it's not nothing to laugh at because you know su a recent survey said like sixty four percent of the Chinese public think that they cannot trust that their food is safe, yeah. they don't feel comfortable with what they're putting in their mouth, which which explains a lot that whole import thing you know, yeah. internet not just the cherries we, the, the brie you know <laughs> I now want to go home and find some brie and cherries right next time we should have like had that right here for these people today but so that. That, that people, you know, that it, it, it's, it's an opportunity for international importers. There's the challenges. But at the same time, you know, when I, I'm thinking also of, 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 of your farmers, that, I mean, you know, there's the industrial scale stuff that Sabrina's talking about, with the, and it's not just dairy. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, do you see, are you optimistic that your, your small farmers are going to somehow ri ride the tide of this oh, development? Die <laughs> no, <it's laughs> but I think here is I think this uh, particular model village got a lot of support domestically, internationally. There are a number, like, dozens of slides I didn't put there is where they, in, uh, what kind of international attention they got. So it's in a way I know Chen is a little special. Okay, from that perspective, that's why uh, that's why we're moving to the next stage. We want to scale up and uh, see if that can be replicated and we can do it in other places. But I think the number one I think in China now is getting. More so is people's concern about the food, and also this recognition that um, industrialized agriculture not necessarily has increased the productivity. You know, there's a number of tons yeah. of research out there already, and uh, which means organic farming actually can feed us 
Our problem is not because we don't have enough food. Is the food are not, uh, you know, I mean, what you call it, equally distributed. You know, people have got too much, some people have got too little. So I think there, those kind of messages are getting out there, but not quite there yet. So in my view, I mean, the reason I'm working on it, I'm still confident. I think with all those particular, even though there is a difficult time for NGOs in China now, but I still think when we are at that stage, I don't think that's a turning point. So I think it the NGOs, you know, they, I really put a lot of hope on NGOs. That's why I'm working with them now. Is uh, they can, uh, you know, sort of start this and really push government to go in the direction and help the farmers out. So I kind of see that I think we're continuing. I don't think they're going to sort of die anytime soon. But but the thing about about your project, Shreya, and I think that that some of the people in the room know the NGO sector pretty well. But but this is a unique one. But it's the kind that of this kind of NGO. I'm going to use the word, it's so popular, but it's kind of, it, there's a resiliency that's been built into it because it has the partnership with the university. It's yeah. not always that common. But also keep in mind, it is not in Beijing. That's right. All right? <laughs> I want to, that's one of the reasons I wanted her to come talk because we hear, so, I mean, again, there's some fabulous NGOs up in Beijing working on high level policy issues, but it's also, it's working with farmers. There are very few, even, even the international NGOs that are working in China. There's not much going on, and even the, the kind of foundation support, you know, just, I don't know, small-time farmers, they're not sexy or something, right? To, to, but, but it's important, and so that's, I think, I'm excited. I was glad I could kind of highlight this. Do we have some other questions? Another couple quick questions out here over on the side there, um, behind you, Sharon? Hi, um, uh, I'm a research assistant at University of Maryland, College Park, and I'm from China. Um, in addition to what you mentioned about the work done by NGOs, I'm wondering, if the business sector, I mean the private entre business entrepreneurs have been working in this organic mm, produce market. Yeah. And because we see that in the United States there are Whole Foods and uh, a bunch of other organic mm -hmm. markets and, uh, and also farm to table, yeah. like those concepts. And, and it also relates with dairy because there's the, the, the green, yeah. I don't know, green milk or whatever, yeah. Yeah, so I just, I'm just curious about what the market is like in China and how many years do you think the, um, the environment or it will catch up with this idea? Mm. Thank Excuse you, that's a good question. Actually, I just recently got involved with this sort of this kind of business interest. Um, this I'm going to give you an example saying um, how situation is in China now. So I think that people are very interested in this because they see the demand from the public. Okay, organic farming particularly. And, uh, um, but most of the Chinese, that's, the con that's consistent with the current trend in China, is all about the maturity, about the consumption. So they want to make quick money. So when they come to us, we actually, tons of them come to us. They want to replicate the Anunter model, they want to bring a bigger scale. All they ask is, can we get the money back you know, within three years? So, and these what are companies. Yeah, what kind, those are companies. What kind of companies are these? As um, individuals, investors, and it could be in the agriculture, like the, uh, you know, they are selling goods. Even the supermarkets came to us, and you know, like Ocean, those big ones. They want to sell, because we don't necessarily want to put up there, okay? So that's a sad issue, different issues. But basically, there are tons of interest, but they're looking for quick money. They want like, three years, can we get the money back? Or what's the return? It's like a 20% or 30%. There is an answer from, not from us, and you know, we didn't get that far is from this woman actually also in Chengdu who had uh, this medium size, you know, 500 acres, like a um, Chinese man anyway. So he, she actually answered, he said, no, uh, for uh, organic farming, you make decent income. You're not expecting to become a millionaire. That's what, that's what was her answer to this business because she was very successful too. So many people went to her. She said, if you want to walk into this business, become a billionaire, don't even think about it. <laughs> so I think the, there is a little agreement among the people who work on this field, knows, and you can make a decent life, you know. You, uh, also, you can make some profits, but not a huge. But uh, meanwhile, the investors or companies who is interested in this business has different mindset. And I, I see some of the people become more realistic and more willing to do this not purely for making money for other purposes, but not the main trend yet. So, but I think it will come along eventually. Sabrina, I know you got something to say here. Um, yeah, I guess there's actually two areas. I mean, first of all, the big processors, so Mengmiao, Yili, I'm not sure about Sanyuan and Guangmin, but I imagine they also have organic dairy lines. Um, they, you know, like a Yeji 
Uh, so they have, I mean, their product differentiation. So anywhere from sort of your standard UHT pure milk up through, you know, nu nutrients added, vi extra vitamin D to organic milk. Um, and you see these in a lot of the sort of big supermarkets in Beijing and Shanghai and the big cities. Um, you also have at the same time a number of sort of cooperative business models uh, where there's a particular private investor uh, who links up with the local government and then they start a particular operation, organic product operation. Um, I think the issue in the dairy industry, again, you have this sort of state business nexus going on. Um, you also have a problem where, I mean, farmers aren't convinced uh, and they're not really being offered dividends <laughs> or the way that the dividends are sort of separated and distributed among the owners and the managers and then the farmers um, has not really convinced them to give up their cows or to join the cooperatives. Um, a lot of these cooperatives um, sometimes just exist in name only. There was a big push for cooperatives in China under the cooperative law, um, and I've seen lots of challenges there with trying to actually have cooperatives that function as cooperatives with all the farmers involved in management decisions and also sort of benefiting economically. So again, you see sort of quick money strategies, you see sort of local government strategies, what, what about that? You said that there are some Chinese companies that are going to New Zealand and putting investment oh, in. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that's so maybe the where other, the cha-ching, yes, you know, other safe milk and let's make a profit. Again, yeah. maybe this isn't necessarily organic, but uh, another trend that's happening is you're starting to see milk products that say made in Australia or made in New Zealand, but with a national brand on them. Um, so this is milk that's brought in from other areas. Any yeah. made in the U.S.? Are any of the Chinese companies investing here no, to I make milk? I, I, I haven't heard of any. Um, Another business opportunity out there, people, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm just curious because because there's also that, you know, that, but there's also in that too, if you think about, the, you know, I'd be curious, it would be really interesting. I could, I could see it now, a milk supply chain analysis. Like I imagine it, they're You know, but I mean, like, but whether or not, whether or not is it, I mean, there's the safer issue, but maybe it is more efficient and less wasteful to actually make the milk in New Zealand and then take it to China? I don't know. Yes, I mean, that's, some of, that's the strategy that some of them are promoting. Um, but yeah, I mean, you see it in liquid milk, you see it in milk powder um, coming from Australia and New Zealand. Hmm. Uh, I imagine that there are also some from the United States. Uh, I mean, and of course, if you go into any of the big international supermarkets, you'll see a whole variety of imported UHT products um, from Europe and U.S. Mm -hmm. and Australia. But I believe this is the first time where they're actually putting national brands on imported milk. Susan, do you have a comment, say, on the business? and? Yeah, I guess I would say, um, you know, when we look at sort of our organic foods, I'm I similarly in the U.S., um, I think in the D.C. area, right, like there's organic food is very prevalent and it is increasing, but, you know, for the average American consumer, they're not necessarily consuming organic um, products right now just because of the price differentiation and availability. And I think, um, you know, as Sabrina and Shrihua has mentioned, you know, that's the case in China as well. That's, you know, not necessarily available for, for the common consumer. And I think, um, as uh, Sabrina alluded to, that maybe for the average consumer, the issue is not necessarily so much organic versus non-organic as safe versus unsafe. And so I think what you're seeing on the business side, so for instance, Walmart, which is the world's largest grocer, is making a very aggressive um, inroads in, in China, and they have these huge new campaigns about you know ensuring that their food is fresh. And a lot of... Um, supermarkets are trying to, and again, probably, you know, more middle, upper class, but are trying to improve ways of transparency where, um, you know, you can, you know, scan a QR code and see the origins of where the food is. They're moving towards more sort of what we see in the U.S., um, away from the fresh markets to packaged meat. Um, and I know Jennifer had been interviewed for a story <laughs> where actually, My pig story. yeah, maybe you should talk, <laughs> talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> we actually put it on our Facebook page where I said, me quote underneath a picture of pigs. This is it. We, we always joke we like pigs here at the China Farm. Farm. There's, a, there's actually a, um, an IT, a, a venture capitalist firm in China that actually invested in um, 
pig farms where you as the consumer, you can go online and see your pig. You can monitor. So it's the idea of that, that, you, that, I mean, it sounds, it sounds frivolous, but it's not. When you think the Chinese consumer has no trust, they don't feel that the food system is transparent in any way, shape, or form, but you can go and monitor your pig and kind of see it as it's going. And so I thought, wow, you know, <laughs> this is, this, it's, it's, it shows you that, that it, it was one an example of, of, the, of the business world in China seeing an opportunity where the government has failed and the corporate sector moves in, you know. My only question was, is that video the same pig? <laughs> but, but, but in theory, but again, but creating transparency, because the food system doesn't yet have the transparency. That said, you know, you know to kind of shift it to now, final little quick, if you, if you want to say something, food safety law is being reformed this year. There's a lot of new things going in. Is there anything that, you, that you're tracking that you think is going to be in that could be helpful for, in this case, your farmers that you're working with, or just in general, as you as a consumer of Chinese food? That I have to talk about your law company. Can I say something else? You can totally say something else, because it's like the microphone's in front of you, and I'm not going to stop you. So I'm not talking about that uh, food the law anyway. I don't have much confidence in that. I think it's a more about institution, and uh, it's a fundamental institutional problem. I don't think the law can solve the problem. Anyway, having said that, but <laughs> there is a one point I do want to make, which I forgot to make. I think it's super important in terms of agriculture, um, ecological farming in China, is the protection, preserving of the um, Chinese traditional lifestyle and the production process. <laughs> and I think the China still have somewhere between seven to 900 million farmers, and they are migrating, migrating to the cities, they have a horrible time, they still having a difficult time. Then this is urbanization, then that process did not give them much room, okay? So I think the difficult time, uh, problem here is, I don't think all the farmers will have opportunity. Majority of them not gonna have much opportunities in the cities. I think their lives, their future still in the countryside. I think the problem here, they're not losing the sort of uh, their housing or lands, they are losing the lifestyle and also tradition. The, the entire culture tradition in the country. And I didn't grow up with that. But when I go there to see, I see the, how to say, their relationship, the cultural tradition and the customer, everything's being affected by the, this urbanization. I don't see much alternative for them at this point. If they, everybody just adopted the city or urban style, you know, sort of lifestyle. So in my view, I think doing this kind of work also they give the farmers alternative to think, to reflect at least, to try to preserve their traditions, their culture, their social values, all kinds of things, I mean really. So that's in my view, I think is very important, but no, many people don't see that. So they are all about like how to make a living, how to help farmer become more urbanized, make a living, but they forgot. As a farmers, they have their own tradition values and beliefs, everything, it's not really being considered this process. So let me say that, thank you. Okay, now since um, you can either, Sabrina, you could kind of answer the question, or this could be just the free range chicken moment at the end <laughs> of the meeting <laughs> to say whatever you would like from your chair, don't wander around. Uh, no, I, I think Chu Hao hit on it at the beginning. <laughs> fundamental institutional problem. Um, and so, Sherry <laughs> <laughs> Wall, you speak, no one else can follow. <laughs> Susan, anything else to add there? Um, well, I'm gonna try to end on hopefully a more <laughs> positive note, because I know it's <laughs> been kind of depressing. Um, <laughs> that I think the food safety law, um, yeah, again, you know, maybe there, you know, it's hard to know whether or not it's really going to make a, a huge difference, but I, I think it does show that clearly, you know, the government realizes this is a huge issue. Um, and I think kind of what, with what we've seen, you know, traditionally CEF, the work we've done has been a lot on air pollution and environment. And we've seen huge strides, especially since Jennifer has been here 15 years, just just how mu how far we've come, especially on U.S.-China cooperation on the environment, culminating in November 2014 when U.S. and China signed the climate agreement. Um, and I think that, you know, kind of the next step when you're looking at food safety is, you know, are we going to be able to cultivate that sort of cooperation on, on food issues? You know, as of yet, we don't see a lot of Chinese NGOs working in this space, which is why we were so excited to have Shreya Hall like talk Hall. about <laughs> Pura and, um, you know, have Sabrina talk about her, her work. Um, and so 
I think that's one thing. There needs to be a lot more advocacy, you know, coming from Citizen Read, more third party associations, um, and then hopefully more cooperation between, you know, there aren't a lot of American NGOs. Again, I mean, there's a lot that are working on China's environment issues, but not so much on, on food. And I, I think, um, you know, lastly, a lot of it, I think we need to look at kind of the sub national um, efforts. So, for instance, you know, ending on. Uh, Farmer Peter, because he's just so fun. He, um, you know, I asked him, you know, how did he even get involved with Tmall in the first place, right? You know, how, how did he hear about it? And so he was telling me that actually what happened is um, he's a part of the Washington State, some a, a growers association. And it, it sounds like Tmall, it wasn't clear if Tmall approached the, the association or the association of approached Tmall, but I believe it was Tmall that approached them and wanted to do this sort of promo video um, about, you know, highlighting these these cherries and um, you know I think especially in in the ag space what you're going to be seeing is it's oftentimes going to be the states that have huge agricultural interests that are really kind of at the forefront of this and so you know hopefully we'll we'll see more yeah. movement on the I mean it's level. you know food it's <laughs> we all eat <laughs> it's the epitome of the level playing field and that there's we're actually the China Environment Forum we're hoping to work with our Kissinger Institute here to be doing more meetings, looking, you know, here we got down in the duck patties, in the weeds, right? <laughs> um, but, but, but also, but hopefully as we work with the Kissinger Institute, because they focus on U.S.-China relations even more, and that we can try to see if we can meld this kind of, raise the conversation about how food safety is yet another area where it, it can be a level playing field, and that there are more opportunities for cooperation than are currently being tapped. So, before I do my final, Goodbye and thank you for the brie. Could we applaud our speakers here for their excellent job in, in talking? <laughs> and um, and just so you know, just I don't know why end of you know dog days of summer we had to we had to do more in this week. Actually Thursday, we did food safety today. On Thursday morning at 9:30 we have a, a interesting group of uh, we're talking about Chinese clean energy investment in the United States. So we have someone from the Paulson Institute, American Enterprise Institute, and Center for American Progress. We bring all colors and stripes together here at the Wilson Center, <laughs> talking about the trends of clean energy investment in the United States, the obstacles, the opportunities. And um, yeah, thank you very much. A lot of you were new to me here. So if you're not on our mailing list, come get our cards, or let us give us your cards so you can join the mafia. Thank you again. And also thanking the Luce Foundation for their support for the China Environment Forum. All right. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>